back in Oxford, um, and I've been told, been told some of the history that today we're treading over hallowed ground, that just down there is the house that Caroline Lucas was <laughs> living in when she was first elected as Oxford's first her green uh, councillor. Um, so I've been hearing some of the history, uh, and you know what we're really hoping to do in less than five weeks' time, and that's only how far away the election is, we're hoping to make history by making the Green Party the official opposition on Oxford City Council. And I think you know, that's something that Oxford has always been a natural stronghold of the Green Party. But what we've got is a real opportunity now, following the Green Surge of last year. Last year, the membership of the Green Party in Northern trebled. And of course, we got 1.1 million votes in the general election. If we actually had a fair electoral system, then we would be seeing you know, Caroline Lucas would have 24 fellow Green MPs in Westminster. Uh, it's not a fair electoral system, and that's something that I'm always talking about. But what we've got the opportunity with these elections is to turn that green surge of last year into green seats up and down the country. So one of the things that I have been doing and will be doing for the next five weeks is travelling up and down the country. Uh, as you can probably guess, I go by train a lot, which means I get more passionate about renationalising the <laughs> About three times a week on average. Um, you know, and it's really exciting because there's lots of places where we've never had green parties before, places like Barnsley, for example, where I was recently, lots of the northeast, places like the South Shields. Um, northeast used to be our, one of our weakest regions, it's now growing as one of our strongest. So what we really want to do is get lots of people elected as their first greens on councils up and down the country. But what we really want to do also is see a huge growth in those long-established staple parties. Now actually somewhere in the middle between those is Bristol. Because many of you will know that Bristol West, we got agonisingly close to winning our second general election seat there. We had a swing of 23% towards us in Bristol West. So what we've got now is they have all our council elections, because they've had a redrawing of boundaries, and a mayoral election. And they have down there a few, those of you who are involved in organising the canvassing and organising here, just spare a thought for Oxford, for uh, Bristol, sorry. You know, Oxford, you've got lots of targets. Down in Bristol, they have 28 target award candidates. <laughs> that's really a territory we've never been before. And that's really what it's like, is you know, up and down the country, we are going into territory that we've never been before. And you know, it's really exciting political times. And this is both the sign of it and something that we can take advantage of. Now, um, you know, that's exciting political times, of course, extend beyond Britain. Uh, some of you may know, down the back there, we have Larry Sanders. Entirely famous as our health spokesperson. Uh, might also have a famous relative as well, Bernie, over in the States. Um, politics is really changing. Sorry? We vote you for him. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, politics is, is really changing and shifting all around the world. And I think we're at a point now where you know, the neoliberal consensus that has dominated what's been seen as mainstream politics the last 35 or 40 years is really clearly bankrupt, even in its own terms, it's failing. And people are looking for something different. And I think you know, what people are looking for and what we're offering, what we need to explain to them how we get there, is a world that meets two criteria. One, that we have to live in a world where we live within the environmental limits of our one planet. And ultimately, that's not politics, it's physics. But where the politics really, I think, does come in is we need to also make sure we've got a world where nobody is then struggling to put food on the table, keep a roof over their head. We need a world in which everybody has access to the resources for a decent quality of life, without fear, without worry. It's where I believe the long-term Green Party policy, citizens' income, universal basic income, is really important to make sure that nobody's left with nothing. So I think you know, we're in a position now where, um, you know, for many years, we've had a role in politics where we've proposed ideas whether it's things like 20 mile per hour speed limits where people live, work and shop, or the living wage. And I am, of course, here talking about the real living wage, <laughs> not George Osborne's fake living wage. Uh, but 10 years or so ago, you know, many people in this room were campaigning for those things. And people said, oh, it's those mad radical greens and their crazy ideas. Now 20 mile per hour speed limits. The city of London, possibly the least radical place you could possibly imagine, is now entirely 20 mile per hour speed limits. Look at the living wage. You know, Osborne has, has stolen the words, if not the actual reality. And you know, the Tories are now talking about a nine pound an hour minimum wage by 2020. In the general election,
Nation. We were talking about 10 pounds an hour 2020, and we had a whole lot of Tories going, scoff, 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 scoff. But what we've traditionally done is propose things that get adopted 10 or so years later as the mainstream ideas. But we need to change much faster. We've got to the point now, you think about the Paris climate talks, you think about what the figures were like for global temperatures in February, you think about how many people in um, shelter did a study a year ago now showing that 11% of people weren't sure that that month whether they'd be able to pay their rent or mortgage. You know, we can't propose ideas, just put them out there, put the good ideas and wait for someone else to take them up. What we need to do is actually elect people to be in there to implement those ideas immediately. To be in there in a position to really make changes. So that's the real step up that I think we've been through with the Green Surge, where now you know, one of the major parties of Britain we need to get out there and get people elected, which is what we're doing now. And I'll stop in a second, because I always think that um, dialogue is more interesting than monologue. But I will just also mention, you're going to be, I hope everyone will be out there campaigning massively hard for the elections in May here in Oxford. Then I'm going to ask you to get out, turn around and go out and campaign really hard again. Because we've got near you referendum coming up. And this is a hugely, massively, potentially, world-changing event. One thing that there's been very little discussion about that we really do need to think about is if we were to vote for Brexit, what impact would it have on the rest of the EU and how destructive and damaging might that be? But also, you know, we saw, thinking back to those Paris climate talks, the world getting together and you know, we didn't get everything we wanted in Paris, but we got every world leader signing up to cut carbon emissions. That's the kind of joint thinking, gathering together that we need to have. And when we look at things across the EU, we need to get together and work with our neighbours to sort joint problems that we need to face. You know, the other side, the Leave campaign, I've heard them quite a few times going, we should leave because then we'll get back our fish. Um, which always comes up in my head, the idea of a fish with a, with a passport tucked under its feet. You know, swimming round in circles because it can't quite go forward with the passport. Uh, you know, it's a nonsense idea. Air pollution, water pollution, all of these things we need to tackle together. They don't stop at national boundaries. And then, of course, there's the whole immigration issue. And you know, we say, as the Green Party, we proudly celebrate free movement for people in the EU. It's something that enriches all of our lives. Here in Oxford, of course, it's a huge issue um, because people, I was uh, you know, out campaigning with someone this morning who's someone from continental Europe working here, you know, contributing to the research of the university here. That is part of the world that we live in. But perhaps it might be easy in Oxford to feel a bit complacent about the referendum. I'm not really worried about how Oxford as a whole, as a city, is going to vote in the referendum. I'm sure it'll be fine. But that's not what matters. What matters is the total national vote. So every vote in Oxford is going to matter. It's not just a case of making sure you get 55 or 60%. We want to get 80% in Oxford because it's going to need to make up for some other places that aren't going to get anything like that. So you know, the election are really important. That's our focus today. But it's only going to be a really short period. It's only another six weeks. So, you know, don't rest, don't go on a holiday then, turn around, <laughs> do the referendum and then go on a lovely summer holiday after that. Um, because, you know, it's worth saying before we all go out canvassing that, you know, politics is fun, knocking on doors is really fun and interesting. You have a chance to have an insight into other people's lives, you learn about their issues, their problems, the things that concern them. Um, it really is interesting and fun. Uh, and, you know, politics is changing fast. People are getting more and more active, engaged, and involved. And every other person we can draw in to start talking about politics, <coughs> thinking about politics. That's another step towards the kind of world that we know as Greens we need to create.